In February 2015, 18-year-old Dalen Pua went to visit his grandmother Martha Bear in Waianae, Hawaii. Once there, he mentioned to his grandma he was planning on going hiking in Mauna Lua Valley Park in the morning. According to Martha, Dalen mentioned he was going to climb the Haiku Stairs, also known to the locals as the Stairway to Heaven. Consisting of over 3,900 steps that ascend the Kohulahu mountain range, the Stairway to Heaven was once a popular tourist hotspot until it was officially closed to the public in 1980 due to the dangerous conditions of the climb. Still, many daring hikers over the decades continue to climb the legendary staircase for the thrill of the challenge, and it's not uncommon for the police and fire department to have to rescue and arrest lost hikers who realize they bit off more than they could chew once they were at the top of the staircase. When Dalen told his grandmother about his plans, she warned him that it was illegal and tried to stop him, but he was determined to climb the stairway to heaven and didn't listen to his grandma. On the evening before the climb, he posted to Facebook with the caption, Stairway to heaven, hiking this insane hike tomorrow, wish me luck. His friends quickly jumped into the comments to remind him that a recent mudslide had damaged an entire section of the staircase, making it even more dangerous to attempt the hike. But the very next morning, Dalen took a bus to Mauna Lua Valley Park and began the hike, documenting the start of his journey on Facebook with the caption, and the hike begins, hashtag haiku. At the beginning of the hike, he sent some pictures of the mountain range to his friends. At around 11 a.m. that day, he sent this last image, after which he became unreachable on all communication channels. His friends tried to get in touch with him, but it soon became clear that something had gone wrong during the hike. The next day, Dalen was reported missing, leading to a citywide search involving the Honolulu Police Department, the Fire Department, the U.S. Navy, several drone pilots, and local volunteers. From the moment the search began, the authorities suspected he had successfully climbed the stairway to heaven, but was unable to come down safely due to the treacherous conditions. On the first day of the search, it rained heavily over Honolulu, making the climb to the top almost impossible for the authorities. After four days of looking for Dalen with dogs, helicopters, and infrared cameras, the search was called off. But later that very same day, two hikers who were climbing a nearby ridge claimed they heard someone screaming for help, and the fire department decided to extend the search another day. But on Tuesday, March 3rd, after days of fruitless investigation, the search was permanently suspended. Still, Dalen's friends and family continued to search the area, posting his pictures everywhere online, and even starting a GoFundMe campaign that raised over $15,000. After weeks with no convincing clues or even a trace of what happened to Daylin, several theories started circulating on the island. While many people claimed he probably fell down the side of the mountain on his way up, others speculated that something much more sinister had happened to Daylin while climbing the stairway to heaven. In the last image he sent to his friends, you can see the head of a man popping up behind the bushes next to the stairway. While the skeptics alleged that the figure was probably just a bunch of leaves and branches and a trick of the light, the Honolulu Police Department decided there was enough evidence in the image to issue an alert and request anyone from the public who had information on the mysterious man behind the bushes to come forward. It now appeared as if Dalen's disappearance had turned into a criminal investigation, with many people believing that the man in the bushes was a stalker who had seen the teenage hiker's Facebook posts and followed him up the mountain to attack him. Some Reddit users thought they recognized the guy, with one user mentioning that the guy in the picture was a good friend of his and that he had nothing to do with the disappearance. But when asked how he could recognize his friend in the image if the man's face was barely even visible, he didn't answer, and nobody's statements on the matter have been verified as true. Almost nine years after his disappearance, the case of Dalen Pua remains a mystery. In 2021, the Honolulu City Council voted unanimously to remove the stairs, awarding a $2.5 million demolition contract to Nakoa Companies. The decision was pretty controversial, but in the end, it was decided that it was the best choice. Unfortunately, we'll still probably never know what happened to Dalen Pua on that day in February 2015, and whether or not the man in his last photo had anything to do with it. This story takes place in Sugarland, an affluent suburb of Houston, Texas, and one of the safest cities in the U.S. On December 10, 2003, Ken and Trisha Whitaker went out to dinner at Papadou Seafood Kitchen to celebrate their son Thomas's graduation from Sam Houston State University. That night, Thomas, or Bart as his friends and family called him, got a $4,000 Rolex watch as a gift from his parents. Over dinner, the family laughed, talked, and teased each other like the happy family they appeared to be on the surface. At one point during the meal, Ken asked his wife and sons to get together for a picture. The image shows Trisha and her two sons, Kevin and Thomas, smiling for the camera, and at first glance, everything seems pretty much perfect. Just after 8pm, the Whitaker family left the restaurant and headed back home. As they walked up the steps to their house, Bart stayed back to get something from his car, and his dad waited for him. As soon as Kevin opened the door, a man in a ski mask held up a gun and opened fire on the family. Within a few seconds, Kevin, Trisha, Kent, and Bart were lying on the floor with gunshot wounds. As soon as the shots rang out, a neighbor called 911, and even though he was injured, Bart did the same as the attacker ran out the back door. When the responding officers arrived, they found 19-year-old Kevin Whitaker dead on the floor. Trisha was immediately airlifted to the hospital, but sadly didn't survive. Miraculously, Kent survived a gunshot wound to the chest while Bart got away with a single bullet wound to the arm. Initially, the authorities called the crime a burglary gone wrong. 
Suspiciously, the alleged burglar left behind the gun he used to commit the crime, but the palm print on the gun didn't yield any useful information. As it was later revealed, the gun had been taken from the Whitaker family's upstairs gun safe, which made it clear that whoever committed the gruesome crime knew the layout of the house before entering. The detectives on the case soon realized that this was no ordinary burglary, as no valuables had been stolen, and the family's drawers and closets seemed to have been neatly pulled out by someone who had been a little too careful not to destroy anything. The day after the murders, detectives discovered that Bart was hiding something from his parents. Not only had he not graduated from university, but he was actually a freshman on probation for not attending his classes and had a 1.4 GPA. About a week after the horrifying incident, Kent and Bart went to Kevin and Trisha's funeral, which was attended by over 1,000 Sugarland residents who had never even heard of such a brutal crime being committed in their city. Several law enforcement officers were at the funeral, not so much to mourn the victims, but rather to watch Bart Whitaker closely. The night before the funeral, a former roommate of Bart named Adam Hip had gone to the police station and made a shocking revelation. According to the police report, Adam mentioned to the cops that one day in 2001, Bart had approached him and told him about an elaborate plan to murder his family in order to inherit their house and about $1 million in life insurance money. Adam claimed that Bart had even offered him a cut of the inheritance money if he agreed to kill his family framed through a burglary gone wrong and shoot him in the arm in the process to make it look more believable. The more details Adam revealed about the chilling conversation, the more the cops realized that the plan Bart had talked about with his roommate was eerily similar to the events that took place on that fateful night in December 2003. During Adam's interrogation, the name of two more of Bart's college friends were brought up, Chris Brashear and Stephen Champagne. Chris and Stephen worked at the same country club as Bart, and when the cops tested their DNA and sent samples, they found a perfect match for what was found at the crime scene. As the detectives closed in on the suspects, Bart realized he was in trouble. One night, about seven months after the murders, he told his father he was going out to the club, and he never came back. The authorities looked everywhere for him, but it seemed he had just disappeared without a trace. With Bart nowhere to be found, the cops focused their efforts on Chris and Stephen. Eventually, Stephen cracked under the pressure of the interrogation and admitted that he had been the getaway driver on the night of the crime. Chris had been the gunman, and Bart had orchestrated the entire thing. Stephen even led the police to a bag that had been thrown off of a bridge into Conroe Lake, which contained pretty damning physical evidence, including two-way radios, water bottles, and ammunition that matched the shell casings at the scene. Almost two years after the murder, Stephen and Chris were arrested, but Bart was still nowhere to be found. Unbeknownst to the police, Bart had started a completely new life in Mexico. He had a small apartment, a job in a furniture store, and even a girlfriend. Disturbingly, it was later revealed that Bart had lied to his girlfriend's family and spun a very convincing tale about his past, alleging that he had gotten shot in the shoulder while serving in Afghanistan. A year and a half after the murders, a man named Rudy Rios called the cops and confessed that about a year earlier, Bart paid him $3,000 to let him assume Rios' identity and flee to Mexico. In September 2005, Bart was arrested in Mexico, extradited, and charged with the murder of his mother and brother. As it was later discovered, he had tried to carry out the plan on several occasions with other roommates and friends, but something always seemed to get in the way. In an interview with ABC News, Bart claimed that when he was planning the killings, he was operating on autopilot and about as close to numb as a human being can get. After the trial, Bart was sentenced to death, a decision his father lobbied against for years. Kent claimed that having his son executed would only make him a victim once again and that he had suffered enough. In February 2018, just 40 minutes before Bart's scheduled execution by lethal injection, the governor decided to spare his life. As of 2024, Bart is still in prison, where he will remain for the rest of his life. Miraculously, Ken has forgiven his son and went on to remarry and even write a book about his experience called Murder by Family, The Incredible True Story of a Son's Treachery and a Father's Forgiveness. For many people, the most haunting aspect of this whole case is the fact that in this last picture of the apparently happy family together at dinner, Bart knew very well that if everything went according to plan, his entire family around him would be dead less than half an hour later. The underscore hillbillies is a TikTok account about a family who talk about their daily lives in the woods and the countryside. If you look at their videos, they never speak about mysterious or creepy things. However, something strange has happened in the woods where their home is. Just let the dogs out and this sh happening again. Dude, what? Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Sean, the father, hears disturbing howling noises out in the woods. Listen to that. What? I don't know. Do why do you think I brought him in the house and run out here? He tells his family to go inside and immediately investigates the noises heard deep in the woods. Listen to that. No more about the 
Do, 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 get him in the house. Get him in the house. Well, whatever that noise is, undoubtedly, they are not alone, and Sean, curious about who made that noise, decides to go out and explore with his dogs. After a few minutes or hours of exploring, he finds what appears to be a deep, dark cave. I think we're dealing with something more than what we thought. We're filming a new Bigfoot Chronicles, and we found what we've been looking for. Look at this. That goes way back. We gotta get some flashlights. Sean then goes back home and uploads these videos to TikTok, and as the next day comes, he's filming his regular vlog until the same howling voice appears again, and louder than before. Life's about spreading love, so tag three people that... Dude. I know I'm not going crazy. Again. All right, that was clear. And after that, he even set up cameras to catch the thing, but his camera disappeared. Sean also got up one night to hear dogs everywhere in the neighborhood barking at what seemed to be the noises the creature made. This is crazy, and I don't know how to explain this. I, I really don't even want to do this. So I left a camera sitting here just to see if I can catch anything. And this was in place of it. This is some blur of weird stuff right here. What the hell? Right there, I put those in the ground to kind of prop the camera up because I forgot my tripod. And now the camera's gone. And it stinks right here bad. Sean then decides to install more cameras to try to catch footage of the thing. And what he catches next is shocking. In Memphis, Tennessee, two brothers were captured in a doorbell footage. One of them was caught by the police the previous day, but they were back together at this house where they lost something. What they lost was apparently their weapons. They knock at the residence and ask the man if they could go and search for them in the backyard, since they dropped them while running away from the police. What's up? Hey. Uh, my little brother done ran from the police the other day. They ran to y'all back y'all. We, we just looking for our guns, baby, bro. What? I said, my brother never lost that guns in your backyard yesterday. They were running from the police. Can we look in your backyard to find them? The police was already running. Yeah, dog. Dog, head that look right quick. We ain't know, we ain't know she be, bro. We just try to find our gun. Go ahead and look right quick. I'm looking at something. The man asks them to search quickly and leave. They seem to head toward the backyard. This is the footage from a home security camera in Vacaville, California. It was April when this footage was taken, and during that time of year, it's common to see a lot of activity in the form of kids walking home from school each afternoon. On this day, at some point, a girl with a backpack on is shown walking into frame. She was walking home from school like everyone else. However, she had been being followed for several blocks by a man in a dark colored Pontiac. She noticed this, and so she used a large truck parked on the side of the road to hide. She abruptly stops walking while she's out of view of the Pontiac. The driver stops, expecting her to come back into view. When she doesn't, he stalls there for a while before slowly driving off. The girl is left standing there, unsure of what to do next. Eventually, she sees the car coming back and decides to stay put behind the truck. Pontiac drives by and then reverses to try and talk to the girl, but she continually repositions herself out of view. Finally, he drives off again and the girl makes a run for it. After receiving multiple tips about the driver and his car, the police started an investigation. A 24-year-old man was identified as the driver. 
He was interviewed, but not arrested. He technically hadn't committed any crime, and therefore police couldn't really do anything. Whether or not the man was actually planning something that day is unknown. In March of 2022, YouTubers Meg and Chris uploaded a new video to their channel, Back in Time MC, in which they showed footage of their visit to a rundown old farmhouse somewhere in the UK. In the caption, they mentioned that they found an entry point through an open window around the side of the house. Based on the state of disarray the farmhouse is in, it's clear that nobody has been maintaining it for quite some time. The floor is covered in leaves and cobwebs, the shoes look dusty and unused, and there are even a couple of dead animals lying on the floor, along with some shotgun shells lying on top of a bedside table. The only clues that indicate somebody could have been at the location relatively recently are that one of the light bulbs in one of the bedrooms looks relatively new, and some of the clothes in the closet look only gently used. Based on the pictures that Chris finds on different shelves and hung up on the walls, it appears as if a family of at least four children used to live in the farmhouse. As the couple continues with the exploration, they walk into one of the upstairs bedrooms, where they find something very unexpected. Oh my god! Get out! You're, you're alive! What? Get out, man! You can't live in here, you can't live in here. Yeah? No! We thought you can't. We thought, can't. We thought, we thought it was abandoned. Here. We thought it was abandoned. When he first walked into the room, Chris didn't notice that there was someone asleep in the bed. It wasn't until Meg walked in and made a noise that the woman sleeping in the bed woke up and gave them the scare of their life. Although the uploaders blurred the woman's face out of respect for her privacy, it's clear that she's pretty old. During the conversation, she tells the couple that she doesn't have any family that could take her to live somewhere else less depressing. Out of sheer kindness, Chris and Meg keep the lady company and try their best to understand her situation. She introduces herself as Jane, and over the next 10 minutes they ask her questions about how she ended up living all alone in an abandoned farmhouse. Thanks to the couple's empathy, the initial shock of being startled by the sleeping old lady and seeing her living in such terrible conditions quickly turns into a heartwarming moment in which the three of them talk about each other's lives. What happened was, I came here to help somebody. Okay. And this is only for a week of coming. Yeah. And that was, um, 1993. Oh, God. Wow, she's been here nearly 30 years. Just, yeah. Disturbingly, Jane mentioned she's been living in the abandoned farmhouse for 30 years, and even though Chris and Meg offer to help her, bring her food, and buy her clean clothes and sheets, she seems hesitant to accept anything from them, claiming that she's fine living the way she does. She mentions that even though it's not her house, the men who work at the farmhouse know she's there, and they bring her food and water every day. In a touching moment at the end, the couple agrees with Jane to visit her again soon. This would have been a happy ending to the story, but Chris and Meg included a caption at the end of the video that cast the situation in a more disturbing light. The caption reads, I did a lot of research to try and find the name of the farm and whom it was owned by. Luckily I got the information needed and I even got a message from someone who knew the farmer who farms there. Chris goes on to explain that the man who reached out to him also knew that Jane was living there and that the farmer also lives in the farmhouse with her. According to the man, Jane is very well cared for, but she chooses to live in those terrible conditions anyway. The man also mentioned that Jane's husband is up there constantly to make sure she's okay, but she doesn't accept his help very easily, or anyone's help for that matter. It's worth mentioning that Jane might not have been completely truthful about her situation to Chris and Meg. During their conversation, she mentioned that she didn't have anyone to care for her except for the farmer, but the man who knew the farmer told Chris that she also has a brother who tries to take care of her. Not entirely convinced by what the man told him, Chris continued digging for information and found that the farm was not on any land registry records, but there was another property to Jane's name that she owned between 1986 and 2015. After visiting the other property, Chris mentioned that it was as unkempt and beat up as the farmhouse itself. Having heard two different versions of the story from the man who contacted him and from Jane herself, he decided to contact Adult Social Services. This is the email he received from them. Good morning, thank you for your email. I can confirm that adult social care are aware of this lady, however, I am not able to provide you with any further details. We appreciate your input and the information you have provided, and thank you for raising your concerns with us." Chris then told the man who contacted him to tell Jane that he and Meg would be happy to go back and visit her if she wanted them to. After this, there were no further updates on the old woman, and we'll likely never know what became of her. The only thing we know for sure is that if someone else decides to explore the abandoned farmhouse in the future, they'll likely run into the same situation as Chris and Meg. 
Sadly, this type of situation is much more common than many people realize. With rising prices and the overall state of the global economy, a large part of the elderly population is being forgotten. Hopefully Jane can accept some help from her family members and live out the rest of her days in much better and healthier conditions than the one she was in when the video was uploaded. This video was recorded in Tartu, Estonia and uploaded to YouTube in August of 2016. In it, a group of four teenagers visit an abandoned sauna that was built more than a century ago in 1915, back when Estonia was still part of the Russian Empire. After fulfilling its purpose for 80 years, the sauna was decommissioned in 1995. The building remained abandoned for 23 years until in 2018 it was fully renovated and turned into a beauty salon, which is still operating as of this video's upload in 2023. In August of 2016, the uploader visited the abandoned location with three friends. Upon entering the building, you can see that it looks exactly what you would expect a building that's been abandoned for 21 years to look like. There's an insane amount of mold growing freely on the walls, the heaters are covered in a thick layer of rust, the floor is full of holes, and the entire structure looks like it could collapse at any second. Throughout the video, the teenage explorers also run into some disturbing messages on the walls. An especially eerie one reads, you can't hide, and there are also several creepy drawings of stick figures graffitied on the walls in some of the other rooms. For the first few minutes of the visit, other than the disturbing messages and some loose shoes and other personal belongings, there doesn't seem to be any indication that somebody could be living there or had even visited the location recently. However, about 20 minutes into the visit, one of the teenagers finds a door frame covered by a curtain, and they decide to explore the room. As one of the explorers shines a flashlight into the room, a gut-wrenching scream can be heard coming from the shadows. Immediately, the four teenagers run out of the building in a panic. When they finally step outside, the sun is already set, and the boys get into the car to flee from the location. Although the explorer was too busy running to show footage of the screaming man, it's more than likely that it was a homeless resident of the abandoned building who wasn't expecting visitors. Still, it must have been extremely disturbing to experience something like that, even if they went together as a group. After that day in 2016, the boys never went back to the abandoned sauna again. Christopher Brian Hill is an urban explorer with a YouTube channel called Urbex Hill. Over the past 10 years, he's been uploading raw footage of his visits to some of the creepiest abandoned buildings in the country, often running into unexpected and sometimes life-threatening situations. Urban explorers like Chris face many dangers. From aggressive stray dogs, to hostile squatters, to respiratory risks and unsound structures, venturing into an unfamiliar abandoned building is much more risky than it might sound. It's obviously much safer to explore abandoned buildings in the light of day and with a group of friends, but in most of his videos, Chris explores at night and always alone. In June 2022, he visited the abandoned Westinghouse Electric Factory located in Cleveland, Ohio. Built more than a century ago, the factory originally consisted of seven different buildings, but most of them have been demolished by now. Even though the Westinghouse Company was established in 1886, it didn't reach Cleveland until 1894. Founded by Thomas Edison, Westinghouse is best known for the notable engineers who worked for the company, including Nikola Tesla and William Stanley. For several decades, the Westinghouse Company rivaled General Electric, and it was last used as a lighting equipment production plant before its abandonment in 1979. For the past four and a half decades, the abandoned factory has been one of the hottest urban exploration locations for curious explorers and YouTubers. In 2012, the factory started receiving even more attention after the Black Widow interrogation scene from the first movie of the Avengers was shot there. Ten years later, Chris made the trip to the abandoned factory and recorded everything he saw. As Chris begins exploring, there doesn't seem to be anyone around, and only the sound of crickets can be heard in the darkness as he walks around the outside of the building. Disturbingly, the sound of gunshots can be heard in the distance less than five minutes into the recording. It's worth mentioning that for the past few years, Cleveland has been ranked as one of the top 10 most dangerous cities in the U.S., making this visit to the abandoned factory even more risky. Chris has experience exploring everything from abandoned mental hospitals and sanatoriums to vacant occult temples, and he shrugs off the fear as he enters the creepy building. Just like in many abandoned buildings, Chris finds a mattress on the floor, meaning at least one person has been sleeping there recently. 
As he captures footage of the first floor and walks up the stairs to the second floor, all that can be heard in the eerie darkness is the sound of his footsteps. A few minutes later, Chris goes down to the basement, and the footage becomes increasingly creepier as Chris runs into a series of dead ends under the leaky, moldy ceiling. At several points during his exploration of the basement, he can be heard making comments about a strange noise coming from somewhere on that floor, and at first he seems to think it's an animal. Alarmingly, he finds a few shell casings on the ground from what was probably a 9mm handgun. Although it would be pretty unsettling to find something like this lying on the ground in an abandoned factory basement, it's worth mentioning that police departments often use abandoned buildings and complexes for training exercises. However, in this case, it's impossible to know if that's really what happened. Shortly after, he comes across a series of disturbing messages on the walls. He continues recording as he walks down narrow corridors, and this is where things get a lot more disturbing. After about 20 minutes of exploring, the visit takes a very dark turn as Chris runs into a hunched over man without a light at the far end of the room. He calls out to him and asks if he needs any help, but the man doesn't move or respond, and Chris decides to leave him alone. Understandably, Chris's breathing can be heard getting louder and heavier after the extremely unsettling encounter, but things were only about to get more disturbing for him. Hey, I got some money for you. He's not there, and he's not responding. About four minutes later, Chris decides to go back to help the man out by giving him a $20 bill. But alarmingly, when he goes back to the room, the man is no longer there. This could be incredibly dangerous, as squatters are known to behave aggressively toward unwanted visitors. And because they know the place better than anyone else, they can easily hide in the shadows and attack or scare visitors when they least expect it. One theory that many viewers seemed to favor was that maybe the man was not a homeless person at all, but a gang member who was hiding from the shootout that could be heard at the beginning of the video. However, it's impossible to confirm if this was actually the case, and it seems pretty unlikely given his strange behavior. As he continues searching for the man, Chris notices bats flying around the basement, and things get even more eerie at this point. Right when he walks into one of the rooms, if you look closely at the far left of the screen, you can actually see the man from earlier standing in what used to be a door frame, staring at Chris in the darkness. Alarmingly, Chris doesn't notice and continues walking. It's impossible to know how long the man had been following him, and in these kind of situations, it can be hard to gauge the squatter's intentions. A few minutes later, the squatter can be seen walking outside as cars pass by the side of the building. At one point, Chris mentions he thinks the guy said hello, but it can't be heard clearly through the camera audio. Just when he decides to head out, he hears a cell phone vibrate, indicating that there are more people down there with him hiding in the darkness. Having had enough disturbing encounters for the night, he decides to play it safe, and fortunately he was able to leave the building unharmed. He never found out who that man was, and since then he hasn't uploaded another video of the Westinghouse factory. At around 1pm on November 2nd, 2020, an 83-year-old mother of four named Paulette Landriax mysteriously disappeared from her home in Anden, Belgium. At the time, her husband was hanging the laundry up to dry in the garden and didn't notice she was gone until later that afternoon. When Paulette's family realized she was missing, they reported the disappearance to the police, triggering a pretty big search for the missing woman. Though, this wasn't the first time Paulette disappeared, as she reportedly suffered from Alzheimer's disease and would frequently leave the house at random times of the day and night without telling her husband where she was going. She was known to randomly knock on the neighbor's doors for no apparent reason, and in the years leading up to her disappearance, she no longer recognized her children or her husband. Every other time she had disappeared, her husband would find her a few feet away from the house and bring her back inside. But this time, she was nowhere to be found. During the search, 50 police officers and several search and rescue dogs were deployed to the area, along with multiple thermal vision helicopters and an entire fleet of drones. 
But even with all these resources at their disposal, the local police department failed to find any relevant clues leading to Paulette. After several weeks, the search was called off, and the family assumed that she had fallen into the Meuse River, which ran near her home. In October of 2022, just as the police department was about to close the file, one investigator was searching for Paulette's house on Google Street View and found something shocking. There, as luck would have it, he found a Street View image of Paulette leaving her home and crossing the street to her neighbor's house. The case was immediately reopened, and police were once again deployed to the area, where they found the body of Paulette lying at the bottom of a hill directly below the neighbor's garden. After the autopsy was performed, it was determined that the woman had fallen from an unenclosed section of the garden and died shortly after. Her final moments eerily being caught by the passing Google Street View car as she walks to her death, likely in another wave of confused state caused by her Alzheimer's disease. One thing that's hard to understand is how the police failed to see her with their drones and helicopters the first time, but at least now the family can find closure knowing what happened to Paulette, even if it comes with this eerie last image of her ever being seen alive. If you visit the location on Google Maps today, you'll find the image has been overwritten by a more up-to-date view of the town. In July 2011, two armed individuals broke into an empty house in an otherwise peaceful suburb of Oklahoma City. With a house full of valuables for them to steal and nobody there to stop them, the two got to work. But unfortunately for them, the looting spree was much more short-lived than they had hoped. A few minutes later, the homeowner returned and walked in on the two of them looting her house. But instead of fleeing with the valuables they had already stolen, they held her at gunpoint as they continued to ransack her home. This went on for over an hour, and during the traumatizing incident, the woman recalled thinking they were going to shoot her before leaving. Fortunately, the robbers eventually left the house without physically harming the woman. After the armed robbery, she refused to reveal her identity to the press out of fear that the thieves would retaliate. The woman later reported the incident to the cops, but with no witnesses and an absence of solid leads, the case eventually went cold and the woman lost hope that the two criminals would ever be found. However, three years later, the case took an unexpected turn. On a day in July 2014, the woman's neighbor was looking at her street using Google Maps Street View when she noticed an image of two men casually strolling down the street who perfectly matched the description the victim had given her of the criminals. Immediately, she texted the woman, who confirmed that the two men captured by the Street View van that happened to be mapping out the neighborhood on the day of the robbery were indeed the same two men who had robbed her. Based on the direction they were walking, it seems that the image was captured in the minutes leading up to the crime. Unfortunately, because the two men's faces are obscured by the grainy quality of the image and Google software that automatically blurs pedestrians, the cops haven't been able to track the men down. But with a string of clues and a picture to add to their search, police now have a much better chance of catching the two thanks to Google Maps. One night in October 2006, a 72-year-old man named David Lee Niles met up with a friend at Jake's Bar in Byron Town, Michigan. This was a place that David visited frequently and usually stayed there for at least a couple of hours, but on that particular evening, the story was very different. Earlier that year, David had been diagnosed with cancer, and after a brief conversation with his friend, he left abruptly claiming that he was in a lot of physical pain due to the cancer. That was the last time anyone ever saw him. When his family failed to get in touch with him, they reported him missing to the police, leading to a statewide search that ultimately led nowhere as the cops couldn't find any clues as to where David could have gone. In 2011, five years after his disappearance, his family lost hope and accepted the idea that David was gone. The obituary they published online read, David Lee Niles, age 72 of Wyoming, passed away and only God knows the time and place. The case went completely cold until almost a decade later when a new twist shed light on David's disappearance. One morning in November 2015, Brian Houseman, an employee of the Cook Funeral Home in Byron County, was decorating the company Christmas tree outside. When he got to the top of the tree on his lift to put up the star, he noticed something in the adjacent pond that looked like a submerged car. Immediately, he called the police, and using Google Maps from a bird's eye view, they were able to see the same outline that was described. A dive team was deployed to the area, who confirmed that there was in fact a car at the bottom of the pond. Later that morning, a wrecking crew pulled out the vehicle for the police to inspect. Inside the vehicle, the cops found the skeletal remains of a man, along with a wallet belonging to David Lee Niles. After it was confirmed that the skeletal remains were his, David's family members finally found some closure. Still, the case remains a mystery, as it's unknown what exactly happened to him. Even before his cancer diagnosis, David was known to have severe depressive episodes, and things understandably got a lot worse for him after he found out about the illness. With all this in mind, it's possible that he took his own life, but we'll likely never know for sure. In the 80s and 90s, Joe Aquino Gamino was one of Italy's most wanted gangsters. He operated within a Sicilian mafia clan in Agrigento that was embroiled in a feud with Cosa Nostra, Sicily's main mafia network. 
He was first arrested in 1984 for murder and various other mafia-related crimes, but was later released shortly after. In 1998, he was arrested again in Barcelona, only this time he was sentenced to life in prison. After serving four years of his prison sentence at a prison in Rome, he managed to escape in 2002 during a commotion at the prison. Following his escape, he immediately relocated to a town near Madrid, Spain, and changed his name to Manuel Mormino. Over the 20 years that he was on the run from the police, he got married, worked as a chef at a restaurant called Manu's Kitchen, and even opened up a fruit and vegetable shop called Manu's Garden. Sicilian police searched everywhere for him for years, and they eventually issued a European arrest warrant back in 2014. After carrying out several investigations, the police suspected that Gamino was hiding somewhere in Spain, but the way they pinpointed his exact location was pretty out of the ordinary. During the investigation, Sicilian police found that Google Maps had captured a street view image of two men talking outside of Manu's garden. One of the men looked extremely similar to the man they were looking for, but the cops only confirmed his identity when they came across a listing for Manu's kitchen, the restaurant where Gamino worked. While investigating online, the police found a photo of him dressed in chef's attire on the Facebook page for Manu's kitchen. After confirming his location, the police arrested Joaquino Gamino on December 17, 2022 and extradited him to Sicily where he is currently serving life in prison. According to the police, when they arrested him, Gamino was extremely confused and even had the nerve to ask how they found him when he hadn't even called his family in 10 years. In 2009, police from Zurich, Switzerland were carrying out an investigation to shut down illegal marijuana growing operations all over the country. At some point in the investigation, they used Google Earth to locate the addresses of two farmers who they suspected of being part of an illegal marijuana operation, and that's when one of the detectives found something interesting. As he was scanning the area on Google Earth, he noticed an unusual change in the pattern of the fields around Rapperswil in the northeastern state of Thurgau. Zooming in, he saw what appeared to be a cannabis plantation that measured more than two acres and was hidden inside a cornfield right next to one of the farmer's houses. The Google Earth discovery ultimately led to the arrest of 16 people and the seizure of 1.1 metric tons of marijuana, as well as 900,000 Swiss francs in cash, which is the equivalent of around $1.1 million. According to the police report, the drug ring allegedly sold up to 7 tons of marijuana between 2004 and 2008, bringing in from 3 to 10 million francs a year. When asked about the breakthrough, the head of Zurich Police's Special Narcotics Unit, Norbert Glossner, said it was an interesting chance discovery. Since then, the cannabis plantation has been plowed over as recreational marijuana continues to be illegal in Switzerland. This incident happened at a home in Derbyshire, England, where David and Rebecca Soans lived with their two children, Lauren and Reuben. In 2009, the family bought a caravan to travel across the country, but it was unfortunately destroyed shortly after when a joyrider crashed into it. A few months later, they bought a new $15,000 caravan to replace the old one, which they left in their driveway. In June of that year, Rebecca came home one day to find the caravan had disappeared, after which she immediately reported the incident to the police. However, with no solid leads, the cops couldn't really do anything about it, and the case went cold pretty quickly. It wasn't until nine months later, in March of 2010, that 11-year-old Ruben Soans found something revealing as he was looking at his house on Google Maps. Using the street view, he found an image of a male intruder on the family's driveway, standing suspiciously outside of his 4x4 vehicle. After a bit of investigating, the family found that the image had been captured by the Google Street View car just moments before the caravan was stolen. Around that time, a neighbor also came forward saying that he had seen the same man towing the caravan on the day of the robbery, but thought that it was a family friend and didn't think it was important to tell the family about it. With such a clear image of the suspect, the Sones thought it would be easy for the cops to solve the crime, but it turned out to be much more difficult than expected to get an unblurred image of the 4x4's license plates from Google. Even though the police knew exactly what the thief looked like, it was never publicly confirmed if they managed to track him down or not. In April 2019, a YouTuber named Jason uploaded a video to his channel, Abbey Mountain Trekkers, in which he recorded footage of his solo overnight trip to the mountains. His channel is dedicated to all things outdoors, in which Jason frequently uploads videos of his adventures hiking, camping, and surviving in the woods. In this particular video, his hike up to the mountain is pretty uneventful, and as soon as he arrives at the campsite, Jason begins setting up his tent and shows his viewers how he starts a fire as the sun begins to set. As he waits for the day to end, he tries his luck at spoon carving, and this is when he reports hearing a strange sound coming from the top of one of the mountains, but he writes it off as a bird or some other small animal and continues setting up for the night. At about 9 o'clock, he turns his camera off to go to bed, but less than an hour later, he wakes up to a strange sound that he says he's never heard before in his life. He mentions it sounded like some sort of guttural animal call, but because it came from pretty far away, he couldn't identify what it was. I'm still 
a rattle. I've never heard anything like that in my life. It sounded like a mix between a, almost like a pig. Some kind of, now I'm not even, I hate to even say it, but a pig, an ape, and the calls almost sounded like how the velociraptors <laughs> communicate with each other on Jurassic Park. I've never heard anything like that. Still shaken after the rude awakening, he tries to go back to bed, but just a few hours later at around 1am, he wakes up again to what he describes as the sound of something or someone circling his tent. Whatever it is, it's close. Hear that? Whatever it is, it sounded like there was two or three of them. And it started on the other side of my camp, went around my perimeter. If you look closely at the bottom left hand corner of the screen, you can see the reflection of what appears to be one or two sets of eyes as he pans his flashlight over them. Although there are many animals with eyes that reflect light at night, based on the fiery white color of the reflection, it's very likely that Jason was being observed by wolves or coyotes. Dog's eyes will also give off a white reflection, but considering that it was around 1am when this happened, it's unlikely that a dog would be walking around in the mountains so close to his campsite. Coyote and wolf attacks on humans are rare, as both species tend to avoid human contact, but they can still become very aggressive if they feel threatened, especially if they have pups nearby. If this were the case, Jason would be in grave danger, but chillingly he doesn't even seem to notice the eyes watching him as he scans the area with his flashlight. Luckily he went back to his tent and slept safely through the night. When he woke up the next morning, he recorded another update for his viewers, but he never mentioned the eyes that his camera had captured the night before, suggesting he might have never noticed. After this video, there were no additional updates on the incident. In 2021, YouTuber Matt Field spent the night in a dark cave in the middle of nowhere in Australia after his friend told him about an unsettling experience he had in that cave and dared him to spend the night there alone. Matt's channel is a bit more extreme than other outdoor exploration channels, and his videos often feature him leaving civilization behind and going to remote locations for days, living only off the fishy catches and the animals he hunts. In the video, he mentions that he didn't bring any water to the trip, hoping to find water to drink in the cave. After about four hours of walking, he finally finds the cave and climbs down the man-made ladder inside. Venturing deeper inside the cave, Matt crawls into the different holes he finds to see if any of them lead anywhere. Around this time, he started hearing a couple of rocks falling near the entrance and the sound of some sort of animal walking around. At one point in the video, he mentions he feels like he's being watched and things get a little more disturbing at around 11 p.m. when he begins to eat his baked beans for dinner. Mm. That is beautiful. Baked beans in a haunted cave. Oh my God. That was the sound. That is the sound. Did you hear that? Look at my, look at my arms. I got full goosebumps. It's the chains moving when I climb down the ladder. It's a big, heavy, thick chain. Wind can't move that. When Matt recorded this video, it wasn't a windy night at all, and the fact that the chain is moving can only mean that there's someone or something down there with him. That chain moved just then. It is 100% now. I heard it before. I'm 100% certain it's the chain that I walked in that you climbed down into this cave on. It's moving. Now, you can't move that chain with wind. It's way too heavy. There is no wind coming in here. There's no wind even for... Holy... Oh, you must have heard that just then. Look at my arms, dude. Oh, this Okay, well, I've got my backpack back on, and I'm booting on Andavia. I just heard a sound. That's it's not normal. It's definitely not a normal sound, and I'm scared. I'm not gonna lie. I've been, it's probably about two hours, two and a half hours after I checked in with you guys, so it would be around two o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, and that sound was not normal. Um, I'm getting out of here. After the creepy noises subside, he changes his mind about leaving the cave and decides to spend the rest of the night near the entrance. A couple of hours later, he reported hearing hissing sounds that sounded like human voices, but after walking around the cave, he couldn't find anything that could be making those noises. 
Aside from big animals, the worst thing that could have happened to Matt is to have come across a hostile squatter living in the cave, although it's unclear why anyone would want to live down there. Fortunately, he made his way out of the cave safely as soon as the sun rose, and never went back to that cave again. Roadie is a channel dedicated to off-the-grid living, in which the uploader usually posts videos about what life is like living out of his truck and traveling around the country. The videos are usually pretty cool, with an emphasis on the beauty of nature and independent living. But this particular video is a bit more disturbing than the rest. In December 2017, Rody uploaded footage of an incident that took place earlier that year while he was car camping in a parking lot. At around 1.30 a.m., a hooded man started walking around his truck and taking pictures of his license plates. Because the back of the truck where the uploader was sleeping was pretty much pitch black, the man probably didn't see anyone in there and continued to suspiciously walk around the truck for several minutes, unaware that he was being recorded. After a while, the man makes his way to the side of the truck and tries to shine the flashlight inside, which is when the uploader decides to take action to protect himself and let the man know he's there. Immediately after the uploader bangs his fist on the inside of the truck, the suspicious man runs away. It's unclear what exactly he planned to do, but based on his behavior, it could have been anything good, and he was probably planning a carjacking. Fortunately, the uploader was able to get away safely and spend the night elsewhere. Gary and Amica are a father-daughter duo from Scotland who make videos about their travels around Europe in their camper van. The videos are usually pretty wholesome and entertaining, but in this particular video, Gary and Amica had a pretty disturbing encounter. This footage was uploaded in March of 2023 during a trip to Tensmere Forest in North Fife, Scotland. As they were walking through the woods, Amica told her dad she heard voices somewhere near them, and after searching for a while, this is what they found. We just stopped that look in these woods. Look at how scary that is. Put the torch on. Here's even one on the ladders. Oh, there's someone playing on the ground. It's it's falling over. Look at the one on the ladders, going up the tree. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's creepy. What about the washing line over there to the left? Yeah, there. Keep it there. That is weird, isn't it? In addition to dozens of creepy mannequins dressed up in costumes, they came across some pretty unsettling paintings hanging outside the little cabin in the middle of the woods. I did some research and found several other channels that featured the strange cabin, but the only information I could find was that the mannequins and paintings were probably set up there at some point in 2021. It's unknown what exactly the purpose of all this is, but whoever set it up clearly went through a lot of trouble to make it as creepy as possible. As Gary and Amica make their way out of the woods, a car starts to approach them from the other side and Gary starts to get a little freaked out. Fortunately, they were able to make it back to the van without having to cross the car's path. As of this video's upload, there have been no further updates on the creepy discovery. In 2018, a YouTuber named John uploaded this video to his channel Lost Lakes, in which he posts about his backcountry camping adventures in Canada. The video was taken at around 3.30 a.m. at a remote location west of Chapleau, Ontario, where, according to John, there was no cell phone signal. Well, I am living every solo camper's nightmare right now. Um, there appears to be an animal of some kind pacing around my tent. It's the middle of the night. And then around 3.30, it, uh, I started to hear this pacing sound. And 45 minutes later, it's still it's pacing around out there. Considering he was camping in a remote location in the black bear capital of the world, it's very likely that there was a bear or some other large animal outside the tent. Although it's rare for bears to attack campers, it has been known to happen. Other animals such as moose or wildcats can also pose a threat to campers if they ever feel threatened or provoked, and in those cases, a feeble camping tent won't offer a lot of protection against an angry 600-pound animal. It's much more common for people to be harassed by other people than by animals, but in this case, the footsteps don't sound very human. To maintain sanity, John shows his viewers the things he brought along on his camping trip to protect himself against animals, which include a hatchet, bear spray, and an air horn. Near the end of the video, he mentions his car is right outside the tent, but he can't find his key and probably left it in the car. But in the end, he slept through the night safely. He never found out what exactly was walking around his tent that night. Most campers will say they're more afraid of running into ill-intentioned people rather than aggressive animals on their camping trips, and this footage is the perfect example of why. Love Sundays is a channel run by a man named Sean who uploads videos of his solo camping adventures in the UK. In a video he uploaded in September 2022, he shows what happened one night when he camped on the side of the road in Cornwall. Technically, he wasn't supposed to be camping there due to parking regulations, so he made every effort possible to make it seem less obvious that he would be spending the night on the side of the road. 
Before the sun sets, he goes into his van and starts making dinner, making as little noise as possible to avoid unwanted attention. At around 9pm, he turns off the lights and goes to bed. Everything seems to be going just fine, but at around 2am, Sean's night takes a pretty unsettling turn. They literally tried to get in the van. It wasn't just a knock in, they were trying to handle. It's not uncommon for solo campers to be asked to move somewhere else in the middle of the night, especially when you're parked somewhere where you're not supposed to be. But in this case, it's highly unlikely that this was a police officer or some other person with the authority to tell him to move, as in these cases, they would almost always knock first and announce themselves verbally. Once they have your attention, they'll ask you to leave, but they won't just walk up to a van on the side of the road and start trying the door handle without announcing their intentions. It's much more likely that someone was trying to break into Sean's van. Luckily, whoever was trying to break in left after only a few seconds, and Sean wasn't bothered by them again. These kinds of encounters can be extremely disturbing, but luckily Sean woke up the next morning unharmed and was on his way to his next destination shortly after.